To provide insight into the cases to watch in the upcoming Supreme Court term, we're joined by Adam White, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and co-director of George Mason University's C. Boyd and Gray Center for the study of the administrative state. Adam, it's great that you could join us today. We've got some big ticket items before the court this term, which will start hearing arguments next week. But before we dive into the cases, what will court procedure look like this term? Well, as many of your viewers may know, the Supreme Court during COVID had to radically change its procedures in order to hear cases in a time when people couldn't be gathered in person. So instead of having oral arguments in person, the advocates would argue their cases remotely. There were no audience, of course, in person, but there was a broader audience outside the courthouse through electronic means. And finally, the justices themselves, instead of their traditional process of just piling uh, questions on top of the advocates in kind of an ad hoc way, they would take turns of all things. They took turns in order of seniority asking questions and then moving on to the next justice. Now, as we're moving out of the, the socially distanced era and the court is returning to something closer to normal business, there's they will have at least some of the advocates in person so long as they pass a, a COVID test and so on. There won't be an in-person audience, but the audience will still be able to hear audio of the arguments live, which was a change from earlier years. And finally, with respect to the justices themselves, they're taking a bit of a hybrid approach. There will be the old free-for-all of questions, one justice oftentimes interrupting another to ask questions. But they will have, at the end of each round of argument, a more orderly close, where each justice will get the chance to take turns asking questions. I think that's a good thing. I think it, in many ways, is the best of both worlds. And I'm very happy because the more orderly process created space for Justice Thomas, who was always yes. a, a bit hesitant to jump into the fray, to, for him to ask questions. His questions have been great so far, and, and I'm glad that the court is trying to strike a balance between the old way and, and the new way. Yeah, that sounds great. And it's exciting that America still gets to listen in to argument, which is something that I know a lot of people were very excited about. Um, let's discuss the November sitting. Right at the top is a new case recently added that we discussed on this show last week, prayer in the death chamber. Why is this round of prayer before an execution different in terms of the procedural, procedural nature of the case? Well, the case is called Ramirez versus Collier. And the question is whether a death row inmate is allowed to have a, a, a spiritual advisor, a, a preacher or minister of some kind, to accompany him into the death chamber and perhaps even place hands upon the, the inmate during the execution process. This is an issue that's come to the Supreme Court a couple of times recently in, in procedural cases where inmates have tried to stop their execution because the state of Alabama or the state of Texas wouldn't allow the person's own spiritual advisor into the, uh, the the chamber. In an earlier case called Murphy, the Supreme Court ordered that the, the spiritual advisor be allowed into the death chamber. And now the court, I think, is going to have an opportunity to really sketch out in clearer detail after full argument and briefing exactly what the First Amendment requires, the, the free exer exercise clause of religion, sorry, the free exercise of religion clause requires in terms of allowing a minister into the death chamber. There's actually a long history of this, yes. especially in the United States. And I think that the advocates for the prisoner here, both his own lawyers and, and the many, many amicus briefs that have filed, uh, have been filed in his favor here, are asking a pretty straightforward question. The December sitting is going to kick off with a case every pro-life advocate is watching. You've written about this extensively, the Dobbs case out of Mississippi. Before you tell me what to expect, what's the status of the latest appeal to throw out an even more aggressive law out of Texas? Well, the last I checked, the law is still standing. There was an effort to block the Texas law in the Supreme Court. I can go into detail in the Texas law if you'd like, but it was, as you mentioned, it was a it was a fairly novel and, and even more restrictive limit on abortion. There was an effort to block it. The Supreme Court denied requests to preemptively block the law. Now the U.S. Justice Department, the Biden administration, has filed a lawsuit of its own that's now pending in federal district court uh, in Austin, Texas, and we should see some movement on that soon. Frankly, I don't expect the federal courts, uh, well, maybe the trial court, but I don't expect the, the Fifth Circuit or the Supreme Court to preemptively intervene and freeze the Texas statute. I think it will remain in effect, limited as it is in its, its practical effect, uh, given its enforcement mechanisms. 
And I think we'll all wait and see what happens in the court in the big Dobbs case coming out of Mississippi. This term also brings up the issue of religious schools and government funding in the Carson case brought by families mm -hmm. from Maine. Is this about denying aid to schools that provide religious instruction or about religious status? What's it about? This is the latest in a series of cases over the last couple of decades, really, on the extent to which uh, state funds either can go to, to religious schools or the states um, can refuse to provide funding on an equal basis to, to religious schools and other private schools. Uh, the, in earlier cases, the, the, the issue was vouchers and whether a student could, or his family could use a state education voucher for religious education. The original case called Lock v. Davey had to do with, with minist outright ministerial education. And the Supreme Court said, no, that the state can deny funding for that kind of education. But in more recent years, we've seen a case in Missouri where the state tried to deny funding uh, for a, a religious school's playground repairs. Uh, funding that could have gone to, to other non-religious schools. And the Supreme Court said, no, there's no justification for discriminating against religious schools here. More recently, we saw in, in Missouri, a case, or sorry, Montana, a case the called... The Espinoza case. Uh, mm -hmm. The Espinoza case, that's right, where, again, the state tried, under the old Blaine amendments, as we know them, uh, tried to prevent uh, voucher funding from going to, to religious schools. And there, too, the Supreme Court said, no, there's no basis here for discriminating against religious schools. Now what we have in the new case, Carson out of Maine, it's, as I understand it, direct funding to the schools itself. It's not a voucher where parents select, but it is, it's, it's funding going to religious schools that families want to send their children to. And in rural Maine, it is a pretty sparsely populated area. Public schools are a little fewer and far between. And so there are perfectly justifiable, you know, non-religious reasons to fund religious schools. The state wants to deny uh, funding to these schools because they're religious or because they, they can't meet the state standard as the state sees it for, uh, for minimizing religious education. The schools argue that they're providing a perfectly straightforward non-religious education. And giving kids access addition, to education they wouldn't otherwise have. That's exactly right. And, and yes, it's education that is accompanied with the, the basic foundation of, of religious uh, formation. But that's not detracting from the from the the non-religious education that they're receiving. Frankly, I, I'm skeptical that the main state the main law is going to overcome uh, is is going to survive this lawsuit. I think the trajectory of cases over the last two decades shows that the court is increasingly putting the burden on state governments to justify very clearly and precisely why they can discriminate against religion or why their discrimination is justified. And I think the court is growing more skeptical of state efforts to just draw broad lines and, 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 and leave the burden on the institutions or the parents to justify their need of, for, for the state funds. Well, we'll be looking out for that. We hope the Supreme Court will throw out anti-religious discrimination this term. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you.